Hey folks, welcome to Black Gumbo. Today we're going to talk about compost. First of all, what is compost and why is it good? Why do gardeners concern themselves with compost at all? Compost is humus. It's broken down organic material. Now, when I say organic in the context of making compost, I'm not talking about, you know, certified organic food that doesn't have pesticides and herbicides. I'm just talking about organic as in it was once living. It's made of tissue, uh, living tissue that has died. So that's what we mean when we say put organic materials into your compost pile. <clears throat> but gardeners use compost as nature's best fertilizer. When, when things rot and break down the nutrients that compose those, those organic creatures and things and living things like plants and grass and leaves, all that goodness in there is stored up in the tissue of that plant or that, that stuff. And when it rots and breaks down, it releases that and makes it available to plants. And so compost is fertilizer. It's plant food and it's excellent for your garden. It's the best stuff you can feed your garden. Because rather than, say, a prepared, well-balanced uh, NPK fertilizer like a 101010 or, or something uh, that's manufactured, uh, you, get, you get a whole lot of the, the broad spectrum of nutrients your plants need in compost. You get not just the NPK, but you also get all the micronutrients and the minerals that were in those living things that you rotted down and composted, and that's good for your soil. It feeds the good biology in your soil. It feeds the bacteria that you need in your soil. It feeds fungi. All of this stuff in your soil builds a web of life within your soil that your plants need and benefit from. And so, so composting is an easy way to take much of your waste that you'd otherwise send to the trash and, and put it in the landfill, take it and put it in a compost pile, rot it down, and you've got free plant food. And not only is it free, it's the best stuff you can give your plants. So I'm going to talk about how I compost and the things I put in it. You're going to read about composting in, in a lot of places online and in a lot of books are going to tell you how to compost. Well, I do it wrong. I do all the things wrong. And um, I'm going to show you what I do. What kind of container do you use? What, 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 what kind of things should you compost in? Um, to start composting, you really don't need a container. If you just want to throw things in a pile on the ground, that works fine. Some people pile up all their compostable materials in an out-of-the-way place on the ground, and they throw a tarp over it to keep the rain from washing everything away. That works. Um, I've also used a wire hoop, uh, a bin system that's just some, some uh, wire hoop you get down at the, at the hardware store, and you make about a a three foot diameter or four foot diameter hoop with this stuff and everything goes in there. That served me for the last decade or more. I've also composted some of my more stinky compost where I don't care if it goes anaerobic in a big garbage can. I uh, put a few drain holes in the bottom just so that uh, the natural life in the soil can work its way up into the compost and I composted in that for many years too, and a large garbage can would give me about um, 50 gallons of compost every year. Now that's a slow, slow composting system, and it's hard to turn that, and that's why I would just let it go anaerobic in there and rot down. But a garbage can will work just fine for compost, especially one that you can actually manage and handle. You put out a big tarp, and when you need to turn your compost, you can dump that out on the, on the tarp and mix it up and put it all back in your garbage you know, container. One with a lid is perfect. Uh, currently, I'm using a three-bin system made of pallets and some of the uh, garden weed suppressing cloth just to keep the, all my compost in so it doesn't go out between those uh, pallet edges. And that's working for me because I need volume. And so I've got a four by four bin and I have three of them. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of volume. And that's what I need, so I've built that. If you have the ability for large volume, that's great. The large volume composting means you need to put a lot of stuff in it and finding and sourcing all that stuff can sometimes be a problem. So you can compost in all kinds of things. They also sell these little composting barrels that you turn. Now those are fine if you've got a balcony or something you don't have anywhere to compost. I had a commenter also who's uh, composting on her balcony with a bucket and making a little bit of compost uh, where she can and that's good. So whatever you use, um, 
the, the larger your, your bucket, the larger your bin or the larger your pile, the more compost you're going to get because this stuff, all this material, it, it rots down to about one eighth or one tenth of the volume that it was when it was fully living and, and wasn't broken down. So a lot of material is going to break down into a little bit of compost, of finished compost. And so that's why I don't use the barrel system that you rotate and turn. It just doesn't produce enough for me, man. I need, I need beds and beds full of compost. And so that's why I've chosen the system I have. But whatever you do, just compost. Even if you've got a, a five gallon bucket and that's all you got, compost in that and make sure you're doing this because the benefits of compost are, are, are far better than anything you can buy at the store. <music> standing here next to my compost bin enjoying the progress of a good hot compost pile I have a running list of what I've put in this compost and most of its standard stuff but a lot of what's in here is not the standard stuff including that bucket right there in that bucket there are dairy products people say oh you can't put dairy products in your in your compost it'll stink it'll attract rats and vermin just stick it in the middle of your compost pile it's fine paper, notes, I guess that's a curriculum price guide, some tissues, some coffee grounds, some banana, there's a banana peel, I always like to see a banana peel. It's peanut butter jelly time! And then there's some smoothie in here, and uh, that's not all smoothie, but there's smoothie in here and some coffee, and so you know we're not gonna we're not gonna use this we've, we've had all the smoothie we want there's kitchen trimmings in here and well it goes in the compost and for me I just pour it right on top I always have a good time putting stuff in the compost pile that you know is rich here we got some chicken stock and vegetables there's some chicken bones in there and chicken trimmings go right in there. People are going to ask, well, what are you going to do about uh, vermin and rats and dogs and things? Well, dogs can't get in here. This is a tall thing. If I really want to keep out larger creatures, I just draw this board over the top of it. And, uh, you know, the possums can't get in there. But even if they do, they're just going to eat a little bit, poop a little bit, turn over some of my compost for me, and I don't care. I don't mind them in there. So long as they're not dragging it around the yard, they're doing their job, too. I mean, the bugs get in here, they do their job, you know, why not, why not something else? It doesn't bother me. So uh, the other thing people say, well, it's going to stink. Well, my compost actually doesn't stink because it's a hot pile. Now, if you put it in here and you let it, uh, you let it just go fetid and rot in a cold composting situation, yeah, then it's going to stink. But even if it stinks, it doesn't stink that bad and doesn't stink for long. Paper towels, corn cobs, coffee, grounds. There is a sermon from the Gospel of Matthew that I shredded up after preaching today. Celery stumps. All of this is future compost. Anything I trim off of these, and everything in our, in our, even rice down in there, you see there's rice. Future compost right there. Stale bread. Hey, that's future compost too. Potato peels. Bits and pieces from bell peppers shallot skins, paper napkins, part of dinner tonight, future compost the next day. See all of this lawn? All of that wasted land. Well, I could get some of it back by composting it. Here's a, here's a nice bunch of compost. This is my dry grade. Any paper packing, this brown paper stuff, this is really good and it composts really quickly. Cardboard goes into my compost, it too composts junk mail, screening stuff, cookbook, old cookbook we don't need anymore, too much old old style thinking in this cookbook, like you're thinking of our parents generation where they used Crisco and butter substitute, we don't need a book like that anymore, we ate well back then, but we can eat better now, so 
leaves from the tree. That's perfect for the compost pile. Now you can do two things. You can compost it like that and it will take a little longer or you can go and shred it in a, in a chipper or shredder or run it over with your lawnmower and make the bit smaller. That'll speed it up a little bit but uh, some, sometimes you don't have time for that. Just throw it in there. All the rules that we go by, a lot of people have been talking about how you can break those rules. I've learned <clears throat> from uh, Steve Solomon, I learned from David the Good on YouTube, and from a lot of other places that I read up on this stuff. You don't really have to worry about all the rules for composting. If it was organic, if it was alive at one time, but it's now dead, you can usually compost. Also, what about heat? Why do you need your compost to heat up? Uh, the heating up of compost comes from the action of the bacteria breaking down the uh, material in your pile. The bacteria, as they work, uh, they put off energy and that energy comes in the form of heat. And a good compost pile will get up to 110, 120, even up to 135, 140 degrees. After you get about over 140, you start killing off your bacteria. Uh, they're they're kind of self-destructive in there. That's hot down in the middle. See that thermometer? That thermometer goes all the way into the middle and tells us if the pile is hot, and it's very hot down in there. How hot? How hot? 140 degrees. Dang. Yeah. How hot is it? Wow, you can feel that heat coming off in there. Feel that? Oh my gosh. Isn't that hot? Yeah. That is hot. That means that the bugs are doing their job down in there. Nasty. I want that heat because that speeds the process up. It makes a nice home for all those wonderful bacteria. And it ki kills off weed seeds, at least some of them. Uh, kills off pathogens and things that might be in there that you don't want. So that's why you need a little bit of moisture and a little bit of oxygen because those little bugs down in there, the bacteria and all that life in your compost needs air and needs water, just like you do. And so that's why we turn our, our compost, or if you can't turn the compost, at least get a, a spike or a rod or a stake or something and drive it down in there and, and aerate it by poking holes in your compost. And water your compost, keep it moist. You don't want it wet. If it's gonna, if it's gonna be a big rain, cover it up. But you want some moisture in there as well. So water your compost and aerate your compost and look for the heat. One way you can open up air channels in your compost is to take a spike. I'm using this long rod that I got. I think it's a, uh, a ground rod, copper ground rod that I didn't use. But you could use any kind of spike and drive it down in there and kind of rotate it around and just open up some air channels into your compost. And that way you don't have to really worry about uh, turning it if you can't really get in there and, and lift all this mass out and turn it around. You can put some air holes through there and just ventilate the whole thing. And that'll uh, serve the same purpose. It's not as efficient, but hey, sometimes we gotta do what we gotta do, huh? So when you have an active pile, your compost gets up to about 130 degrees or so. Man, that's hot. Now you'll read in books and you'll hear on various uh, you know, YouTubers and websites that you gotta layer your carbons and your nitrogens, your browns and your greens. You don't have to do that, but that's a good practice actually because uh, you know, that mixes up the materials. So they say when you layer your carbons and nitrogens in your compost pile that you should have a 30 to one carbon to nit nitrogen ratio for the ideal pile. That's a lot of carbon. 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. I guess if you've got a ton of carbon and not much nitrogen, that's easy. I find it's a whole lot easier to come by nitrogen. And so I don't really pay attention to the ratio. I just layer things and it seems to work for me. Now I have uh, right now about equal parts nitrogen to carbon and my compost pile is burning away at 130 degrees and it's doing fine. <clears throat> if I had more carbon and, and uh, you know, if I had more cardboard boxes, if I ordered more stuff from Amazon, if I had more bad theology books I could throw in there, I would. And that would really uh, speed up the process quite a bit. These microorganisms need uh, both nitrogen and carbon, but they need a lot more carbon to really get going. So what are some sources of carbon and nitrogen? 
nitrogen is usually your green stuff like this branch this is a piece of my uh, lime uh, tree that is being pruned off and being made a small fruit tree and so I'm doing some summer pruning and this will be a good source of nitrogen while it's green there's like all, all that chlorophyll all that green mass in there and so we'll put this in and layer it up as a layer of nitrogen lawn clippings make a great nitrogen layer um, coffee grounds though they're brown they are actually a technically a green in your compost pile they make a good source of nitrogen so there's nitrogen all around usually nitrogen is plentiful um, any kind of food scraps are usually nitrogen um, carbon though is usually for me at least harder to get because I have a fall leaf drop but most of my leaves are oak leaves and they break down really slow so I use those as mulch but your carbon your browns are things like cardboard this is a piece of cardboard that I used as temporary mulch in my garden over there and that started the breakdown process you can see it's already got all kinds of good bacteria in there and so I'll shred up this cardboard by hand I don't I don't use a shredder or anything and I'll just put this right in my compost pile and I'll let that act as my carbon so I use a lot of a lot of cardboard a lot of paper a lot of uh, to-go containers those fibrous kind egg cartons those kinds of things are good carbon source for your garden wood chips Although I don't use a lot of wood chips, uh, when I do have some, some branches or something, I'll send them through my shredder. And that makes a good source of carbon too. So carbons are your dry materials, your dry leaves. Leaves that uh, the chlorophyll's already broken down, all you're left with is the carbon structure of the leaf. So fall leaves, if you can gather them up and bag them up and save them, you layer that in, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon. And that's how you really get a compost pile that's hot and works fast. Compost has been amended into every single bed in my garden. And you can see I've got three beds. They're four feet wide. Gosh, I don't even remember how long they are. And so if I need to amend my soil in all three beds, that's a lot of compost. I can extend that compost with compost tea, but I also like to amend my soil. It really promotes good biology down in there. One way to use compost is to side dress your plants. Under this mulch, I've put compost down just along the bases of my cucumber plants, for example. Let me cover it up with my mulch. Now this mulch is actually uh, mostly uh, oak leaves and grass clippings, and it is composting in place, and that's beneficial too. But oak leaves are one of those things that takes a long time to break down. But I came along here and I poured compost along the base of my plants. And that's a good way to amend your soil and to add fertilizer to your soil, putting this compost down as a side dressing. Compost is also a major component of potting soil. I make a potting mix with um, one part compost, one part peat moss, and one part perlite or any other kind of thing that uh, will give aeration to your soil. And this uh, squash plant here is doing pretty good despite having survived the plague of, of spider mites. There's compost in there and that plant can feed off of that. So I use compost also to mix in with my potting soil. In preparing your beds each year or before each crop actually, I go in and you add compost to your soil and that puts natural nutrition in your soil and it's a fertilizer that's available for your plants and it is a good amendment to your soil in terms of uh, you know uh, fostering good soil life you want all those earthworms in there you want all that uh, biologic activity down there and compost feeds all that it helps your soil out a lot right here on this bare patch of soil I have some cowpeas that I've sown in here and they are um, going to sprout in the next couple of days but what I've done is I've put compost on top and kind of raked it around a little bit just to amend the soil and give those cow peas some nutrition so compost is good for just spreading around amending your soil laying on top top dressing I practice in this garden no till gardening I don't dig as I try not to dig as much as possible and so I just put my compost on top but if you do dig, if you double dig or if you till, you want to till that compost into the soil and amend your soil with it. Another way folks compost is to make compost tea. Now this compost is really old compost. It actually has some old potting soil in it mixed in. 
but most of this is compost and so you can take a little bit of this look how rich that is and put it in a bucket and you can add some water to that and make compost tea So you'll fill this up and let that compost brew in there for a few days in the sun and all that nutrition will leach out into the water and you can use that water to fertilize your plants and it's called compost tea. This is a real good way to extend your compost to make it go further and to make sure you get all the nutrition from your compost into your plants is to put it on there as a water soluble thing. What do you think Phoebe? <laughs> So, if you let that just brew now, you can come in later and strain out all that mess that's in there, or just dip in with a, a cup or something, and you'll have some good fertilizer for your garden, really powerful stuff. There's another way you can use compost. It's in this awful, vile, terrible, horrible bucket. I've got another video that talks about anaerobic composting and I'll let you go watch that video. I'll link it up here. But what's in this video um, is not covering anaerobic compost. You don't really even want to know what's in here. But uh, I'll show you. That smells like raw sewage. Thank the Lord for wind. This is a nasty, nasty way to compost, but it's also a very powerful way to compost. And it's a good way to build compost tea that you can use directly in your soil or you can use to charge your compost pile. There you go, a little bit about compost. If you have any composting questions, please, please leave a comment. We'd be glad to interact with you and chat and talk about compost. Compost, <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. Well, I hope uh, that I've shared something that maybe you didn't know. Maybe there's some things I don't know about compost that I need to know. Leave us a comment, write us a you know what you might do and what how you might compost uh, in a better way or how you might improve our compost because man i need a lot of it thanks for joining us please subscribe if you haven't done so already like us on instagram and facebook and we'll talk to you next time we post a video take care bye bye